Hey, and welcome to chapter three, listening, attending, and empathy, essential for relationship building. All right, we have our awareness and knowledge. We are going to develop a solid understanding of how attending behavior, attention, and selective attention form the basis for all theories of counseling and therapy, understand how the basics of neuroscience explain and expand the importance of attention and empathy, learn how teaching micro skills of listening is a useful therapeutic strategy with both children and adults, and discover micro counseling's use in medical law and business training and other professions, both nationally and internationally. May sound a little bit daunting right now, but it's not, it's not bad. All right, skills and action, ability to listen, provide empathy, and communicate more effectively with your clients whose backgrounds may be different from yours. Now, all of this stuff may sound familiar, and you may be thinking like, gosh, I feel like I've learned this already. You're going to notice that a lot of these themes are kind of interconnected, and you're going to hear things that you've heard before, but it's all just building on a new competency. All right, ability to adapt your attending patterns and style to the needs of clients with different cultural and individual styles, including those whose backgrounds and beliefs may be different from yours. Ability to use recovery skills when you are lost or confused in the session and when it is clear that your last counseling session or comments were not fully helpful. Even the most advanced professional doesn't always know what is happening. When you don't know what to do, attend. That's really in the book. It is okay to not always know what you're doing or what to always say. Use that attending behavior. Use those listening skills. Ask questions. Ask for clarification. It is okay because sometimes you're going to be told things and you get stumped and you're like, oh, okay, haven't heard that one before. And that's okay. You learn how to keep the face, but also being reflective, being authentic, and just asking questions. All right, ability to use listening skills in the context of telemental health or telepsychology, ability to use training and listening skills as treatment and teach listening skill workshops for a variety of groups, including businesses, churches, peer counseling, and many others. These are not things you would do in the beginning, but as you further your you know, counseling career, there are gonna be times where you may be asked to teach something, or you may ask to do a speaking, you know, engagement, and it's really good, you know, number one for your resume, for experience, um, but it's good for you. It helps you learn more and get more engaged with your community. And then ability to promote practice, 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 practice is the way to become an intentional listener. All right. Attending behavior is supported, is supporting your client with individually and culturally appropriate verbal following visuals, vocal quality, and body language and facial expression. That's attending behavior. Um, it's essential to building an empathetic and therapeutic relationship. And then the listening component is the core skill of attending behavior and is central to developing relationships and making real contact with clients. So listening is more than hearing, right? Anybody can hear anything. We can hear lots of stuff, but actually listening, that's when it's really going in and you are attending to what they are saying. So attending and listening light up the brain. Many areas of the brains of both counselor and client become involved. One way to understand good quality listening is to experience the opposite, which is poor listening. So you can do this by role playing. So you can find someone to role play with, spend a few minutes role playing a poor and ineffective listener. And then after you do the role play session, you can ask your client, right? How they felt inside or emotionally when the counselor did not listen. If no partner is available, think of a specific time when you felt that you were not heard. You know, when we really sit back and reflect on times in school with our parents, with our partner, with our friends, <clears throat> when you talk about something, how, can you ever remember a time when they like followed up or were they kind of paraphrased or were they kind of interjected and asked for clarifying like details? Or if it was more like, uh-huh, yeah, yeah. And then you went back and you're like, hey, remember when I told you this? And they were like, what? So that's when you know the difference between like hearing and listening. All right, 
When you use the micro skills, you can anticipate how a client is likely to respond. Again, this big word of micro skills ends up just being a thing you know, not something you have to like say, but it's just, oh yeah, I know what that means. Um, attending behavior has predictable results in conversations with clients. These predictions are never perfect, but research has shown we can generally expect specific results from various types of helping interventions. And if your first attempt at listening is not received well, you can intentionally flex and use a different skill and not the flex that we've heard from the young people, like such a flex, whatever. I know that wasn't funny, right? Whatever. Okay. Attending behavior, support your client with individually and culturally appropriate visuals, vocal quality, verbal tracking, and body language, including facial expression. It is okay to laugh with them. It is okay to like nod your head when appropriate. You don't want to just be nodding the entire time. Um, but you know, look, look away, look at them. It's important to like whatever you're feeling with them to attend to that behavior. And then the anticipated result, they're going to talk more freely. They're gonna respond more openly about all different types of subjects um, when you are giving your attention. So depending on the individual, client and culture, eye contact, vocal tone, comp completeness of story and body language, body language will vary. Not all cultures look you in the eye. And you know, as a clinician, that is, we are trained to look at our clients in the eye. But when we have a client whose culture is not to look at you in the eye, especially when they perceive you as an authority figure, they're not going to look at you maybe. And that's okay. You never want to tell your client, hey, look, look at me. Or are you, are you thinking about something else? I've had clients come to me and say that their previous therapist was like, hey, why aren't you looking at me? Or blah, blah, blah. And it's like, read the room, know your audience, learn about culture, learn about you know, hey, we, in our culture, it is disrespectful to look at someone in the eye. So you don't want to force them to, you know, practice your tradition or your cultural understanding and awareness. You have to meet your clients where they are. All right. Attention is the connective force of conversations and empathetic understanding. We are touched when it is present. We know when someone is not attending to us, you can feel it. You can feel when you're not being listened to, when you're not really fully being heard. Attending behavior is the first and most critical skill of listening. It is, necess it is a necessary part of all interviewing, counseling, and psychotherapy. Sometimes listening carefully is enough to produce change. So just having someone there, your client having you there to listen and be present, sometimes that's all they need. Sometimes they don't need a lot of you know, uh, in, in a session, you know, not all the time, but in a particular session, they don't need strategies. They may not need, you know, tips and tricks. In that moment, they just need to be listened and that's it. All right, to communicate that you are listening or attending to the client, you need the following. It's the three Vs plus B, visual eye contact, vocal qualities, verbal tracking, and body language. These are all important for you. So when we look at the description, the visual contact, look at people when you speak to them, okay? You as the clinician, the vocal tone and qualities communicate warmth and interest with your voice. It comes through, it really does come through. Uh, think of how many ways you can say, I'm really interested in what you have to say just by altering your vocal tone and speech rate. You don't need to say that, you can say it in other ways. You can try that, record your voice, get a partner, you know, experiment all different types of ways. With your verbal tracking, stay with the client's topic, track their story, and avoid topic jumps. So you don't, you as the clinician don't want to change the subject. Listen to them. When you find that they're jumping around, you want to rein them in a bit as well. The client is there to talk, not to listen to you. It's really important, especially when, you know, you're, you're uh, an E, so you're an extrovert if you are an extrovert like myself, I had to train myself to zip, shut up, listen. Introverts, way better at the listening component, right? They listen, they take in all information. So it's just really important to always remember that the session is about them, not you. Remember that the session is, again, for the client. And then the body language and facial expression, be yourself. Please don't be a robot. 
Be who you authentically are. Authenticity is essential to building trust with your client. To show interest, face clients squarely, lean slightly forward. So I lean into my clients. I remember what I said in the beginning, mirror their body language. If it's very anxious, kind of mirror that. Then you want to load that so they then follow you. All right, uh, use encouraging gestures, especially critical, smile to show warmth and interest in the client. You don't wanna just sit there. I've seen a lot of my students when they do their mock sessions, they just kind of like are very, their affect is flat. They mm -hmm. don't wanna do that because then they feel like there is a block, a wall. So you wanna be able to laugh You want when appropriate and you wanna be able to just be who you are. So try, make sure to try to, you know, role play that with people and if it, you know, helps. All right, so the three Vs plus B, reduce counselor talk time and provide clients with an opportunity to tell detailed stories. Increase awareness of clients attending patterns. Note clients' patterns of eye contact, changing vocal tone, body language, and topics to which your clients attend and those they avoid. It's, it's Important to jot those little notes down. Again, we don't want to be writing notes. We just want to jot little things down. Note individual and cultural differences in attending. Attending behavior and listening are essential for human communication, but we need to be prepared for and expect individual and cultural differences. So you don't need to know everyone's culture like, <clears throat> like a, you know, I need to know everything about this culture. You're going to learn that from your client, but that's where attending comes in. You lean into that. And the more you counsel someone from a different background than you, the more you just, you know it when they walk in the room. All right. Listen before you leap. Avoid trying to solve their difficulties too soon. It is not a one and done. It may take multiple sessions for them to really lean into you. Clients develop their concerns over time. It's critical that you slow down, relax, and attend to client stories. Use the three V's and B to understand clients' concerns and build rapport. Visual eye contact, observe cultural differences in appropriate amounts of eye contact. Maintain and break eye contact as needed for specific results because you don't want to stare at your clients, right? You don't want to make them feel uncomfortable. So when they're telling you something, it's okay to sit back and, and you know, just kind of look up and say, yeah, you know, like I'm thinking about that. And the more like you say that, you know, I'm, I'm really understanding. So it's good to look away than to look back and reflect. Observe their pupils for dilation and use specific body language to achieve desired results. All right, the vocal qualities, tone and speech, rates, changes in pitch and volume, speech breaks and hesitations, and speech rate can convey your emotional reactions to the client. Verbal underlining. Those are the key words a person underlines by meanings of volume and emphasis. Expect some significant things to be said more softly. Expect a lower volume when a client is talking about a difficult issue and match vocal tone to the clients in these cases. So like I said, when you're leaning in and you're matching their energy, if they're talking low about something, maybe they are embarrassed about something, or maybe you're doing a virtual session and the client, you know, their husband, spouse, whoever is in the other room. When they're talking, you know, lightly, you match that and you talk a little bit lightly, not as lightly as them, but you want to match that. All right. Accents. What are your reactions to the following accents? Australian, British, English, Canadian, French, Pakistani, Castilian, Spanish, New England, Southern United States. Avoid stereotyping people with accents different from yours. Like eye contact, body language patterns differ according to culture. Maintain culturally appropriate distance. Note clients' movements in relation to you. Note your own body language patterns in the session and maintain authenticity in the client relationship. Some people do not like closeness, so it's good to know that. You'll feel that when you're near them. If you don't like closeness, it's good to, you know, maintain that little bit of distance. My office, I have couch. There's nothing that separates me from the client. It's important that they feel that there's a, an openness. So if at all possible, if you have a desk, maybe put the desk in the corner, um, have your chair, your couch, or whatever you have more in an open space where it's just you across your client. 
right? Verbal tracking is staying with your client's topic to encourage full elaboration of the narrative. Now we look into selective attention. That is, the, that is central to interviewing, counseling, and psychotherapy. Clients will talk about what counselors are willing to hear. How you attend determines the length of the session and whether the client will return. You could have a very, you know, an hour long session, but after 20 minutes, they may feel like they have nothing to say because maybe they feel like they're not being listened to. So that client may decide to leave early. I've had clients come to me and say that they've done that. So it's really important to keep the flow of the conversation and the topic going. All right, observe the selective attention patterns of both yourself and your clients. What do your clients focus on? What topics do they seem to avoid? And ask yourself the same questions. That, those are the things you want to know is, what are they avoiding when they come to counseling? What are they more willing to talk about? So you want to note that so then maybe the next session, next session, you could focus more on that without directly saying that to them. All right, there are times when it is inappropriate to attend to client statements. So an example, a client may talk insistently about the same thing over and over again. Through failure to maintain eye contact, subtle shifts in posture and vocal tone, and deliberate jumps to more positive topics, you can facilitate the interview process. So redirect the conversation to focus on positive assets. Again, we're not looking at false positivity or toxic positivity, but when you notice your client is focused on the same thing over and over again in your sessions, that means there's no growth taking place. So you wanna make sure that eventually you're maintaining that eye contact and you're subtly shifting that conversation to something different by maybe asking them a, a question that leads them in a different direction. All right, the usefulness of silence. Sometimes silence is key. So um, the most useful thing you can do is support your client silently. So silence can be uncomfortable if you make it uncomfortable. So when, when they tell you something that may be very intense, it's good to just stop for a moment and reflect on what they're saying. So search for a natural break in the client's speech and attend appropriately. The auditory cortex in the brain remains active when you are attending in silence. Talk time. Clients can't talk while you do, so it's important not to interrupt, um, especially virtually. Sometimes you're when you're on, you know, with a client, there's lagging time. So if that happens, it happens with me sometimes, and it appears like you're over talking someone. It's important to say, "Hey, I think we're having a log a lag in our in our internet." So if I seem to be over talking you or vice versa, we can like just stop each other. So review your sessions for talk time. Who talks more, you or the client? With adults, clients talk time should be more and the counselor should talk less. We're doing, we're asking questions, right? We're not putting, we're putting our take in things, but it's for them to talk and for us to really hear what they're saying. With less verbal clients or children, you may expect that they talk less and you talk more. And again, you wanna make sure that whatever you're talking about is appropriate. All right, training is treatment. Social skills training is training in a specific set of psychoeducational strategies oriented toward teaching clients an array of interpersonal skills and behaviors. These skills include a wide range of behaviors like listening, dating behaviors, drug refusal skills, assertiveness, mediation, or met, yeah, mediation and job interviewing procedures. So that may sound like a lot in this moment, but you're going to have clients that come to you with different things, different issues, and learning to attend to that behavior is very key. And you'll learn all of these things as you continue in your training. And a lot of people get afraid of psychoeducation. I wanted to point that out because people think, oh, I'm not good at psychoeducation. And that could be that maybe you just don't know what it is. So psychoeducation can be as simple as someone coming into your office and they are talking about, you know, dating violence or a relationship issue that's not going well. You may know of a domestic violence center or you may have information on that and that can be just giving them a brochure a pamphlet a phone number something like that that right there is psychoeducation 
All right. Virtually all interpersonal actions can be taught through social skills training. Training as treatment is a term that summarizes the method and goal of social skills training. Implications for your practice. Many clients can benefit from training and education in listening skills. All right, so now we're going to look at empathy, awareness, knowledge, and skills. Empathy is experiencing the client's world and story as if you were the client. Understanding their key issues and expressing them accurately without adding your own thoughts, feelings, or meanings. This requires attending and observation skills, plus using important keywords of the client while distilling and shortening the main ideas. So when you're practicing empathy, you know, the short version of empathy is putting, right, putting yourself in their shoes. That's basically the short elementary version of that. But empathy is really immersing yourself in their world without making it about you at all. And so that you have to attend, you have to stop, you have to reflect. So that's a good description of what empathy is. And then the anticipated result of that is your client is going to feel more understood. They're gonna become more engaged in opening up and exploring the actual reason they came into therapy. Um, empathy is best assessed by a client's reaction to a statement and their ability to continue the discussion in more depth and eventually with better self-understanding. So that's the key. You want to teach them essentially how to have empathy for themselves because they come in feeling broken, feeling misunderstood, certainly having no empathy for themselves. So it's kind of our job to teach them those skills. You know, we are a therapist, but we're also a teacher, a coach, a, a raft. You know, we're a lot of things to our clients. Subtractive empathy. Counselors' responses give back less or distort what the client has said. Don't want to do that. Basic empathy. Counselors' responses are roughly interchangeable with those of the client. Okay, maybe in the beginning when you maybe don't really understand. And then we have additive empathy. Counselors responses add to or link to something the client has said earlier or a response may be a congruent idea or frame of reference that helps the client see a new perspective. That's where we wanna focus on is the additive empathy. All right, this three point scale is often expanded for classifying and rating the quality of empathy shown in a session. So again, you've got your love level one subtractive, your level two is your basic, you know, and it may be that for you in the beginning. And then what, what you want to strive for is that level three. All right, when we look at neuroscience, so brain and empathy. <clears throat> empathy is identifiable through functional magnetic resonance imaging or an fMRI and other key technologies. Key is to process, key to this process are the mirror neurons, which fire when humans or animals act and when they observe actions by, by another, and that you can see through an fMRI. When listening skills are not successfully implemented, empathy falls apart. Listening and empathy are not just abstract concepts. They are measurable and make a difference in people's lives. When I was going through my graduate degree, I took a neuroscience class, and in that class, you learn a lot about mirror neurons. You learn a lot about studies where they've taken people and they put them under a scanner and they talk about, you know, certain, you know, it, things that have happened, traumas, and you see what areas of the brain are activated. So this is kind of like at your basic level, but once you get further in your academia, you will take these classes that where you have a better understanding of neuroscience and empathy. All right. What do you think about Alan's positive and negative interviewing examples? That is in the book. Um, I did not attach the page number, um, but go ahead and look at that. What we're doing in this in this section is you're look you're observing, you're looking at intending behavior and empathy. All right. So were they effective in developing a good working relationship with Azara? What differences did you notice in Azara's reactions to the first and second session segments? And what are the major differences between the negative and positive examples? So go ahead and look at that um, interviewing example. All right, the social distancing and reduced mobility required during the COVID-19 pandemic demanded online approaches in all areas of counseling, psychology, social work, psychiatry, education, and others. So when, 
you know, I'm in my practice and when COVID happened, all of my practice was in person. Once COVID happened, I had to learn to adapt to see clients virtually. So then I started seeing my clients virtually. Then BetterHelp reached out to me and asked for me to, um, you know, join their platform. So as a secondary, I joined BetterHelp where I saw clients virtually, phone sessions, and even eventually I started doing chat sessions. Now most of my clients are virtual because it kind of shifted from in-person to virtual and it was my clients. My clients, you know, came back in person, some of them, and then they were like, you know what, I wanna go back to the virtual. And just so that you're aware, studies have shown that virtual sessions are just as effective as in person. You know, you may think like I used to think, well, I need to see them, I need to see their body language. But the more skilled you become, I would say in your internship and in your practicum, you're gonna get a lot of that in-person stuff. But the more, you become immersed in this. You don't need to be with them face to face. You feel the body language. You hear it in their voice. You see it. You don't have, you can see them from neck up. You can have a sense of what's going on below. I can sense when my, my clients are fidgeting and I don't even see them. So the more you practice, the more you get in this, you might be very comfortable with doing telehealth. All right. So, Telebehavioral health and telepsychology made it possible to provide education, prevention, assessment, and treatment from a distance. In many cases, this proved to be as effective as face-to-face -face services. There are a couple studies here that show that. There have been more that have come out since then. Uh, this practice has helped many clients, such as young, chronically ill client populations and persons experiencing anxiety, depression, or suicidal ideation. I have a separate story I can talk about you know, chat session, um, because before that's our ego. I was like, I don't want to do a chat session. That's not effective. And I actually had a client come to me through the platform and said, I, I can't see you face to face virtually that I am so anxiety prone and even talking on the phone. I can't do that either because hearing your voice, you hearing mine, that makes me anxious, but I can chat. And long story bearable, I was like, you know what? I need to get out of my ego and do this because this serves the client. So I did that first chat session and I was amazed at how much she got out of that session. So much so that the more we were chatting throughout the weeks, she opened up so much. She ended up, she was had high social anxiety. Long story bearable, she ended up going on she got a, you know, like a, a van and she ended up doing a U.S. road trip. And it was incredible to see how far she came from, you know, being in isolation and not wanting to talk to being able to talk and being engaged with people. So that was a really cool experience for me. And it opened me up to chat sessions. All right. So practitioners indicate that training and telehealth supervision facilitated delivery of effective services. It is suggested that telebehavioral health training should be part of any mental health program, highly suggested. They also reported high comfort and satisfaction using this new system due to the training received. They were able to make real connections with clients. I was pleasantly surprised to find out that telehealth is effective and I can engage with the client. It really attuned me to listening. You focus on what you are hearing. Much, you'll be surprised how much you focus in a virtual session. You may think that attending skills are simple and obvious and may be anxious to move to the hard stuff. Cognitive learning through reading and study does not mean one has the skills and is really able to listen to clients empathetically. Effective listening takes time, commitment, and intentional and deliberate practice. So this class alone isn't going to do it. You, it's going to help. It's going to start build, building that reserve, but you need more practice. All right, so again, practice. Intentional practice is the magic. Recognize and enhance your natural talents. Greatness only happens with extensive practice. Practice is the breakfast of champions. Practice makes permanent. doesn't make perfect. It's careful what you practice. So make sure what you're practicing is correct. And skipping practice means mediocre performance. Practice changes your body. Both the brain and body change with practice. Skills are specific. 
Each skill must be practiced completely before it can be integrated into superior performance. The brain drives the brawn. Changes in the brain are evident in scans. Areas of the brain relating to finger exercises or arm movements show brain growth in those areas. Expect the same in your brain as you truly master communication skills. Practice style is crucial. One can understand attending behavior intellectually, but actually practicing the specific skill of attending makes the difference. That's why it's important to do these mock sessions. It helps you with your practice and seeing your growth. Short-term intensity cannot replace long-term commitment. You will want to take what you learn about counseling skills and use it regularly. Practice provides continuous feedback loop, which leads to even more improvement. Additionally, feedback from colleagues on your counseling style and skills is especially beneficial. So for key points in practice, central goals of listening, four aspects of attending, attending behavior, listening and in individual and multicultural differences, attending behavior research, empathy, the neuroscience of active listening and empathy, training as treatment, practice is of the essence, and of course, ending with your portfolio of competencies and personal reflection. So those are all the key points and practice of what we just went over. I went over the 30 minutes, a little bit over, but that is okay because this needed to be said and examples are important to be given. So hope you enjoyed that, you know, talk and, you know, please keep practicing, be engaged, and you're going to notice from you know, your first initial mock sessions all the way till your last ones through your academia, you're going to see just how much you've improved. So until next time, chapter four, you have a wonderful week. Peace.